Hi and welcome back to another CAD video here on my channel. I'm just back in Berlin. I participated in an Intel Q&A live stream one day ago. And during that live stream, we had a lot of questions from our German enthusiast community regarding the e-course and p-course, even though I thought this is already clear to everyone, but some people still think that it's a very bad idea to have them. We had a lot of questions like, why don't you do like 10 p-course and zero e-course instead? That should be much better. So a lot of people are, I think underestimating uh, what kind of like power and efficiency those e-cores have. Um, before launch, I already performed some testing regarding the e-cores with Process Lasso. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this software, but I think this particular software is absolutely brilliant for a hybrid CPU design. There's a lot of things we can do with this and that's uh, my plan for today's video. The base for our testing will be this MSI C690 Unify X board, which is basically an overclocking board from MSI, which only features one DIMM per channel, so only two sticks in total, currently running 5200C36 with those Corsair Dominator Platinum sticks. Otherwise, the 12900K is running a manual overclock of 5.1 GHz across all of the P cores and 4.2 GHz across all of the E cores. With this board, I already performed an overclocking guide, which will come online within the next days. I still have to put some work in this, like uh, doing all the graphs and stuff. But it will be a very, very extensive video, which will also feature, for example, how the voltages work on the 12900K and all of that coming soon within the next days. Seasonic, the heart of your system. Just rerunning R20. You can see the system is pretty much on the limit like by two or three degrees Celsius, wouldn't be able to clock this any megahertz higher for P and E cores. You can see, uh, by the way, I messed up. Uh, the E cores are only clocked at 4.1, not 4.2. Multi-score just below 1100 points and single just below 750 points. And this is the tool process lasso. It's an, a very amazing tool. There's a lot you can do with it. It's like a very intelligent task manager version. You could basically call it with an action lock where you can see what your system is doing, what all the different processes are doing. It's brilliant to measure what's going on in the background of your system. For example, just using Cinebench. One thing is, for example, the priority class. Sometimes Windows 11 is putting Cinebench to below normal priority class. And you can also change this permanently, which is amazing. So you can set this to high and because it's set by always, it will always stay high. If you set this to current, it will just be like adjusting this in a task manager. So if you reboot, it's gone. But as long as you keep process lasso running and the process lasso process in the background, this will always adjust this directly. And what is pretty awesome is that you can also adjust the CPU affinity permanently, for example. So you could go to always, now just select anything, it won't matter. Now we go to options, CPU, CPU affinities, and now we can find Cinebench in this list. Double click, so it will appear to the bottom left. And now we can uncheck all the P cores with the SMT cores that are included. So for example, CPU 0 would be the P core and the CPU 1 would be the SMT core that's included. Now add to list and this way it's running on the threads 16 to 23, which means that it's only running on the E cores. And now R20 is exclusively running on the E cores. Let's check out performance. You might be surprised how much performance the e-cores have if you use them exclusively and compare it to like an older dedicated CPU. So I'm just waiting for Cinebench R20 to finish. Meanwhile, there's something I want to add about Process Lasso. I discovered this tool like four or five years ago when we were running an HW competition and we had to set, I think it was the CPU affinity during 3D mic, I don't know, Time Spy or Fire Strike CPU test, something like that which was working very elegant with Process Lasso. If you're using this, there is a pro version which costs about 20 euro. There's also freeware. I'm not sure if all relevant features are available for the freeware. You have to maybe check that out. But what I wanted to add is if you're installing that, there is always something which is called Bitsum Pro Balance, something like that, like predefined profiles inside the software, which are like optimizing the processes that are running in the, in the background and the foreground of your uh, system, so you should definitely disable that, otherwise you will not know exactly what your software is doing. Disable that and just do everything manually. R20 Multi is still running, single already passed with 424, now Multi passed with 3203, which was purely running on the e cores and the e cores were just sitting at around 55 degrees Celsius, not even 60 degrees Celsius during 
the R20 load. This is what we could see temperature wise during the run where the P cores were active. But now look at this performance. The single core performance is exactly the same as the 7700K. And the Multi is about on the level of a Ryzen 7 1700X. The cool thing is that Intel included these die shots with the review kit, which makes it very easy for what I'm just trying to say, because this way we can easily just use a ruler and check out the size of the P-cores. So that is uh, one P-core, and this one right here is one E-core. Obviously, it's a different scaling than the original, who would have thought? But this way we can easily compare, at least percentage-wise, how much performance does an E-core deliver versus a P-core? And now after solving those very complex mathematical equations, I could figure out that an E-core has roughly a fourth to a fifth of the size of the P-core. So it's like 20 to 25% of a P-core, the size of an E-core, but it has the performance of about 30 to 32% of a P-core which makes this quite amazing. So it's like a fourth or a fifth of the size, but it has a third of the performance. And that's quite awesome, especially if you sum that up to the amount of cores, it definitely makes, an, makes a difference. And multi-core wise, it makes absolute sense to have those e-cores there. It would make actually sense to have even more of them there. Probably efficiency wise, I guess it would be better to have six P cores and probably 16 e-cores. But I also guess that's what we will see in the future, probably next Intel generation, at least according to the leaks, like the 13th generation will feature the double amount of e-cores. And I guess multi-threading wise, this is really a good idea. But talking about good ideas, uh, or maybe a stupid idea, not sure, let's just game on an e-core or game on e-cores. I will change the system to a 3080 Ti and then we will move the game to the e-cores. Added the 3080 Ti, it was hanging down a bit, so I added something for additional support, put it underneath uh, the PCH heatsink, and now we will run the first test, just the CPU stock. Well, the stock core configuration, the CPU is still overclocked. Remnant from the Ashes in 1440p, which I think is probably one of the most common resolutions, and it's not that high GPU load than just using 4K, that would probably remove much more load from the CPU as well but we're having about 200 FPS average and about 113, 115 in the 1% low. Just open process lasso again, sorted by CPU usage, utilization. Now again, CPU affinity always just pick anything, go back to the options, CPU affinity. Let's select this and just remove all of the P cores. And then I'm very curious how big the impact will be at to list. And now it's fully running on the e-cores. Now check this out. If you're hearing complaints again that the e-cores are crap cores, I simply cannot agree. Of course, it's much slower than running this on a p-core. But it's, it's not even half of the performance. Previously, as I said before, we had about 200 FPS average. Now it's about 125 and it's still 71 FPS in 1% low. This is, this is absolutely playable and it's fully running on the e-course, on the e-course only. And just so you know that this is really working and legit, you can see there's almost zero load on the p-course while the e-cores are used by, I would say, like 50 to 70%. And the max load on the e-cores, because I kept HW info open in the background, the peak load was like, I would say, somewhere between 70 and 95% on some of the e-cores. And it was also quite amazing. CPU package power, peak 66 watt. While, I mean, the p-cores and everything, this is still manually overclocked. I guess stock, this is maybe like half. That's quite insane. Sheik joined us again for the outro. So I just want to add that the e-cores are not as bad as some people are imagining it. This has nothing to do with like Atom cores from 10 years ago that you used to have in your netbook. Because that's the impression some people still have. It makes absolute sense to have a separation, like a different type of cores within your CPU. It makes no sense to waste the performance of your p-core putting like discord and chrome and whatever on the p-cores it just doesn't make much sense that's why i think this hybrid solution also looking for this from amd that is probably the future and it's not like those are shit cores the the performance is great 
you can even you can literally game on this if you want to obviously this doesn't really make much sense but also with process lasso if you're worried that something with like the thread director wouldn't work as intended then you could do this manually you could you could do this easily manually with a tool like that also if there's something running in the background and you want to have it running on the p core you can also do that you can also do the opposite obviously all right thanks for tuning in see you next time bye bye